Now we'll call up uh, Richard Stanton, Deanna Bittetti, and David Weber. Welcome to all of you. Sir, would you like to get started since you're settled already? Sure, that'd be fine. Uh, My name is Richard Stanton, and I'm the CEO of Bintro. We're an aggregator of classifieds, and we rely heavily on access to publicly available data. I reviewed the pending legislation, and I'm going to make the assumption it will soon be law in some shape or form. As we sit here today, seven nations, eight states, and eight U.S. cities have already adopted open data legislation. There are currently over 270,000 federal data sets available from just the start of four one year ago. There are over 250 applications using these data sets, and this is just the beginning. Some examples include an application that shows the amount of aid given to each country by the U.S., including detailed facts and news related to that country and the aid given to it, an app to see the adoption of broadband in the United States, and things as innocuous as publicly available listings of who is visiting the White House and whom they're visiting. These apps I just mentioned were all built at RPI in Troy, New York, just an example of what's popping up with these available public data sets. The web has gone through an incredible evolutionary process over the past 15 years, and right now we seem to be in the open data stage. There's an immense appetite to take data, especially in semantic form, and turn it into valuable applications that range from consumer-driven applications and also those that benefit the greater good of our society. To me, data is beautiful. I liken it to a child that needs to be raised properly with love and good guidance, with and without structure to be socialized with context, and to grow to provide back even more to the next generation. Data can lead us to a cure for cancer by way of the NIH's ontology. It can help us find a lost child, Amber Alert data, which is publicly available, and can hold our leaders accountable for how our tax dollars are spent, public funds research. We are all products of social construction, and data is no different. It needs time and attention. It needs to play nice with others. It needs to explore relationships in order to grow so it can live on its own. Data, like a child, can bring joy, make you laugh, but it can also make you agonize as well. Simply put, to me, data is organic, and we are just in the infant stages. To most in this room, raw data is valuable data. And as a community of technologists, we would be willing to raise the data for this city as we go forward. On a more practical level, the transparency of democratized data is an incredible leap forward for local governments and will bring New York City into the center of what will be a rapid growth movement over the course of this decade. An example of this would be making available all government job openings and outplacement services for laid-off government workers. We can also make available public space that the city no longer is using because of the downsizing of the government. This could be used by startups and entrepreneurs just if they knew about the availability. From transportation to public safety, New York City will see an awakening from its release of data. As I mentioned, we should not underestimate the societal importance of raising a child well, and the same can be said for data. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is David Weber. I'm a senior member of the ACM and a member of the OASIS XML Public Standards Organization. I'm an XML technology evangelist and a long-term implementer of information sharing solutions for government applications. Um, There's basically two types of data that we're considering here, the structured and unstructured data. People are very used to unstructured data that they see on web pages constantly. Uh, The problem with that is that it's difficult for search engines to harvest and index and link, and hence harder for people to find consistently. The uh, alternative is structured data, which is used to publish data sets that are freely accessible via a data mine, for example. Uh, But then... Not all of that data is created equally, as the previous speaker was uh, alluding to. Without a vocabulary, lexicon, and approach, you end up with a lot of noise in the system that actually, uh, over time, inhibits access to the data as the mind grows. So future-proofing your data is very important. And as we know, technology moves extremely rapidly, so it's very difficult to pick Uh, particular flavors of standards only to find that then those are actually uh, a problem uh, later down the road. So this is a paradox. How do we do data right and standardize how it is done on the one hand, but not being able to, uh, what we don't want to be is prescriptive so that it blocks out new innovations and technology as we move forward. And then added to that is the risk of vendor lock-in and uh, we all know about that, how Uh, selecting a limited set of providers that uh, ultimately develop special software that you need to access data 
uh, provides uh, uh, inhibitors to how you can get at things. So using open public standards and open source friendly technologies are therefore key. So an uh, uh, earlier speaker talked about that. Um, so rather than adopting open vendor APIs, which initially may be alluring, you have to be very careful that these are not then the sole sources of data and that people have direct ways of getting the data if they need to. And notice that APIs can also harvest data, and I think an, another speaker mentioned this, so you can have people register what information they're interested in, but you can also see who is requesting your data. So there's a lot of uh, big challenges here. Um, I want to mention the NEEM initiative, National Information Exchange Model. Um, you should look into that and how that's gone about uh, providing a common platform for federal government to share information. And then similarly, uh, o uh, OASIS worked with the state of California on election record uh, reporting, and this had a lot of um, interesting aspects that people just don't see when they start to get into sharing information. Who's the authoritative source? Who has access to it? Um, and when and how? Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Diana Bittetti, Associate Director for Common Cause New York. Common Cause New York is a nonpartisan advocacy organization um, that fights for increased transparency and honest and accountable government. Thank you for the opportunity presented here today to allow us to speak about how government transparency can be through expanded through the creative use of developing technologies. Many local governments nationwide are figuring out how to use the internet to make government data more accessible. The goal is to utilize the technological power and usefulness of websites and mobile applications and perhaps even foment change in how citizens think about their city and its government. Open data models lend themselves to creating a more inclusive, accountable, and transparent government, cornerstones of our democracy. Initiative number 29 before us today would further the slated goals of Local Law 11, which was first introduced by former Chair Brewer in 2003, to position New York City as the leading the nation in using information technologies to improve the efficiency and accessibility of municipal government. The provisions of this bill that would make data sets publicly available through linkage with the city web portal in a manner that is easily accessible promotes the public interest by allowing data sets to be meaningfully reviewed and utilized by the constituencies. When I was walking into this room, I noticed that most people here actually had out either an iPhone or a Blackberry. I um, use one as well, so how great would that be if we could harness all of that um, into looking right now at different data sets and actually be focused on um, interacting with our city governments. The provision that all public records shall be made available in the raw or unprocessed form is the right step in making sure that the integrity of the data sets remains intact and there is no perception that data has been aggregated or compiled in any subjective matter. The intention of this bill that all public records shall be updated as often as necessary to preserve the integrity and usefulness of the record also helps to maintain the continuous flow of open data to the public and creates a paradigm for best practices for city agency reporting. Too often data sets are outdated or not updated in real time, creating obstacles for those who are looking for information that will help them to better serve their communities. Whether it is information regarding property sales, um, Department of Building Issues permits, or as an organization such as ours that looks to analyze um, and compare data results and look at performance metrics of different city agencies. However, some of the recommendations that we have for the committee today, I think one or two were already referenced, that we would like the committee to consider um, amending the proposal to require the, re the re record policy and technical standards drafted to specifically address mechanisms for public input and oversight regarding any shortcomings of the data available. This would complement the affirmation provisions already in the bill that seeks to maintain the data's integrity. Um, this could be done relatively easily, such as simple comment features that you find on blogs or online submission forms or simple ways to allow the public to provide their thoughts and concerns to the relevant agencies. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Let, let me just follow up on that last point since you didn't quite get to finish it. You want to add some sort of a uh, an opportunity for the public to comment on the quality of the information that's being put out there. Is that correct? Correct. And also, I mean, I think that if the public does see 
discrepancies in data or have reason to believe that certain information was put out, there should be some kind of public comment feature that allows a more thorough interaction of the public with the city agencies. I mean, if the reason behind this, we all know, is to um, not only increase transparency and government accountability, but also decrease do requests on FOIA, um, a good way of doing this would just be having an interactive feature right there that allows constituencies to register their complaints or concerns and get feedback right away. Have you seen the public comment element on data mine that exists and that the commissioner testified about earlier today? No, I have not. Okay. Well, I was just going to ask you whether you had any, any comment on whether that satisfied any of these concerns or whether you think that we should be going further, but we'll leave that for we another time. follow up on that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Council Member Brewer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. Um, you have obviously worked in some of the other data sets around the country. Yes. Which ones, uh, or just generally, what are some of the aspects that work that you would like to see uh, replicated here in New York, just generally? Well, I think someone previously to me said that, you know, replicating the format of RDF, which is coming out of data.gov, would be a wonderful thing to do. I think, though, in terms of time and interest, just having raw data will allow entrepreneurs to figure out what to do with it. You know, I could sit here and come up with probably a thousand different applications for the data in my own mind. You do that across tens of thousands of developers and people, and they're going to come up with things that are going to be wonderful. The bottom line, though, is that um, there are a lot of public safety issues that would benefit from having multiple interactions of users, understanding the data that's out there, understanding the relationships of that data. Just to give you an example of that, um, someone pointed earlier to an ontology in New York. We like to say in our company, it's very important for us to know the difference between Madonna, the musician, and Madonna, the religious figure, or the Bronx Bombers being the same thing as the New York Yankees. All this data, all these relationships, all this understanding comes from being able to take raw data and glean from it these relationships and understanding and context. So I, I think that because there's not a lot of technologists maybe involved in the process of creating the law itself, it may not be understood that just getting it out there can get us started to a point where wonderful things will flourish. And I think that was best illustrated when I said that over 275,000 data sets are now available, and it's growing very quickly. And I do spend a lot of time in Washington recently talking about this, both the State Department and other organizations that are moving so quickly, it's incredible at a federal level. Okay. Do you want to comment, sir? Just about what works? I'm going to push that twice. Um, first of all, I did uh, just email in my testimony uh, for you. Apologize, I didn't realize you had it printed out. I am too much XML. <laughs> um, yes, I, what I see is that uh, this complexity challenge is a really difficult one. Um, working with uh, the federal government and the NEEM initiative on standardizing definitions of things and getting consistent formats is really, really important. I know there's a big push to get data out there in whatever format that you uh, can, and I hear that. But conversely, there's simple measures that you can take early on in the process so that you don't end up with a big uh, mess up, up, up front. Um, and what we're talking about here is not rigid for, uh, standards, but flexible ones where things are named in a coherent, consistent way so that you have predictability about the information that you're seeing. Um, and the other aspect of this is, I, you know, obviously there's XML, there's many different flavors of it. This gentleman was mentioning RDF. Um, don't, you know, don't bet the farm on one thing. Um, what I, I heard earlier that you were talking a lot about spreadsheets, and that's obviously... Uh, one area that you can publish data in. But a little known fact is, and I included this in my written testimony, that you can actually build spreadsheets that are uh, interoperable with XML mm -hmm. so that you can view that data either which way. You can download the XML, view it as a spreadsheet. These are very empowering things that you don't want to limit by saying we only pick these particular flavors. So what NEEM has done is provide a broad range of guidelines to developers that they can then follow that ensures consistency across the community um, and, and the use and development of open standards. And what I've particularly been working on for the federal government is building open source software to facilitate that. And I know you heard that earlier, but I can't stress how important that is 
uh, because then you have resources that anyone can access and use, not only externally, but you yourselves. You, you talk about the cost of developing this for New York. And if you focus your efforts and your monies on building tooling that will really accelerate what your own internal people can do to develop this, and again, I mentioned that uh, state of California election law, they were going down a hellish convoluted path that involved a year's worth of development, and we were able to show them how to do that using open source and simple approach in a few weeks. Right. So it's very important. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, one last question for me from Ms. Uh, Bittetti. Uh, we heard a lot uh, today about the ways that this data can be used by web entrepreneurs to make it more accessible and user-friendly. Uh, you noted that the purpose of Common Cause is to strengthen public participation and faith in our institutions uh, of self-government. Can you say a little bit about how you think this might help to empower communities or help uh, the, the good government uh, process? Sure. Um, and I would have to say, actually, that I could see it both from a good government point of view and also as someone coming from an elected official's office, um, understanding frustrations of constituencies when they would come regarding requests they had given to FOIA, waiting for those requests. Um, and there was a lot of resentment, feeling that this data and this information should be readily available to them. They shouldn't have to go to request it. They shouldn't have to come to an elected official's office to follow up on it. Um, I think also from a good government perspective, having this data readily accessible even for us cuts down on the amount of time that, and resources that we spend having to track down certain data, have to find it in the raw instead of looking at aggregates um, and looking at trends over time. There is also a way for constituencies, and I think it works for both the government itself and for constituencies to look at performance evaluations for agencies, um, to look at caseloads, to look at um, number of people that were served to look at over time and then even you know from a good government perspective we might compare that let's say with the budget for the organization or what money is being spent on and if we're talking about public monies if we're talking about the public trust i think this changes a lot of the perspectives on the ground about what the government is or is not making available um, and just that perception itself that we see is so prevalent especially nowadays um, will definitely help by creating a government that people see as open, people see as responsive to their needs, um, especially in local communities. Great. Well, thank you very much, and thanks to all of you.